Hello, Auggies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Today's question comes to us from Gar Williams, K4GSW. He has an interesting question here, and we can spend a couple minutes on this. He says, hello, Dave. He's working on his general class license, and the manual says, for more information, the third paragraph states, if you're interested in short-range regional contacts, maybe 80 or 40 meters would be a good choice. Longer range contacts are easier on the higher frequency bands of 30 to 10 meters and six. That what is said there is probably true for the daytime, certainly not necessarily true at night. He says, I was under the impression that all things being equal and with the same amount of power, the longer wavelengths, 40 and 80 meters, would be better for long distance contacts. And the shorter the wavelengths, the more power would be required for the same distance. That is how people thought 100 years ago. When Marconi was still doing his thing and they were communicating with ships over the big broad Atlantic and trying to get signals back and forth. And of course, we all remember the sinking of the Titanic and how much that impacted shipborne radio and so on. And the radio that everybody had to carry and monitor until reasonably recent, well, last 20, 30 years, that's recent for me, was to monitor 500 kilohertz, which is down below the AM broadcast band. It's a long wavelength indeed. Okay, and that is the one that has been in use since the days of the Titanic accident. Nowadays, people use satellites and HF and all of that, and so on and so forth. What we are getting into is what this book talks about. This is from the League, and I highly recommend it. It's called Here to There, Radio Wave Propagation. And this takes the entire HF low frequency and microwave and so on, lots of diagrams and everything to show how it works without getting into the mathematics of Maxwell's equations. Basically, it comes down to this. There was a guy by the name of Heaviside. It was a wacko, weirdo kind of guy. He was also brilliant. And he is the one that took Maxwell's original 21 equations which were done in terms of quaternions, and redid them in terms of vector calculus, and reduced the number of equations to four. So when we talk of Maxwell's four equations, we're really talking of Heaviside's reduction of 21 quaternion equations, quaternions are terribly poorly behaved, down to uh, just the four equations. Now, just because they're vector doesn't mean you won't run into complex numbers, you will but they're the ones that are kind of the absolute truth for describing how electromagnetic fields operate. Rather than dig into all of that, let's talk about another thing that uh, Heaviside discovered. He co-discovered this at the same time with a guy by the name of Kennelly. It was for a while called the Heaviside layer, and then for a while the Kennelly Heaviside layer, and nowadays we call it the ionosphere. He postulated that an ionosphere must exist because radio waves were seen to go so far beyond the horizon. It was well known that they traveled in a straight line or relatively straight line. Uh, Einstein came through and showed that magnetic fields, electric fields, and gravity could uh, deflect these. And it is known today that the radio horizon is about four-thirds that of the optical horizon. But this layer is where things get problematic. The ionosphere is composed of three layers, D, E, and F. D is apparent during the daytime when the UV radiation from the sun is strong enough to penetrate through the upper atmosphere, get down into the lower ionosphere. We're still talking 75 miles above our heads and ionize it so severely that it acts more as a shield than a mirror. And 160 meter, 80 meter communications can't penetrate it in the daytime. Uh, now there's some things you can do with NVIS, but during the daytime, you'll probably have to use 40 meters. 40 is my favorite band, by the way. 20 is a close second. 
The higher bands are entirely dependent upon reflection from the ionosphere and may reflect and think of it as a waveguide around the earth. You've got this ionized layer and you've got the ground and the waves bounce like this. They can bounce as many as seven times to get all the way around the world. By then they're, they're pretty doggone weak. You need a good antenna and high power to do that. So I did a video some months ago describing the various bands and how they worked. Basically 40 meters is good in the nighttime because the D layer goes away with the sun. So now the 40 or the 80 meters can get up to the uh, F layer. The F layer does the heavy lifting here. Then you've got 40 meters which is open in the daytime and also open well into the evening. And right now with the high sunspot cycles is a pretty good 24 hours a day. The next good band is 20 meters. Now 20 meters is not affected by this ionization in the D layer and it just travels right through it as though it's essentially transparent. It gets up to the F layer is bounced and so on. 20 meters is the workhorse amateur radio band and you can get signals going enormous worldwide distances on the 20 meter band well into the evening and if you've got good sunspot cycles like right now good sunspot numbers on our 11 year solar cycle we're at the peak about the five and a half year point you can get worldwide communications at night now when you go up from there it gets a little iffier 12 meters would be good midday 17 meters midday 15 meters midday although uh, two solar cycles ago I spoke with all of Russia, Europe, all places like that on 15 meters at 11 p.m. at night. So the path was pretty much covered in darkness. And then you get up in the 10 meter band. The 10 meter band is open often in the afternoons, sometimes a lot more than that. Now what happens with that E layer in there? The sporadic E, meaning from time to time, unpredictably, it will reflect uh, waves, it can duct waves, it can can, C-A-N, duct, D-U-C-T, meaning take them as though they're in a waveguide and take them a long ways around the world. Very interesting propagation that you can do there. So the bottom line is this. The early radio pioneers were wrong and it was amateur radio operators who showed them that they were wrong. They had to give up on Spark and use CW or vacuum tube type transmitters, a good antennas and so on, but you could communicate over different frequencies depending on the time of the day or the time of the evening. VOACAP, V-O-A-C-A-P, is a piece of software. It's online. You can run it online and put in your parameters for what you'd like to do and it will tell you the time of the day and the frequency band to do it. And you'll find that you can get some Pretty amazing stuff with it. Each of the HF bands behaves very differently from each other. This is one of the reasons that hams were given access to 60 meters. Not very much access, but a little bit. And that access allows them to use propagation features that are between 80 and 40 meters. So for disaster relief and things like that. So for all the stuff that's going on in the Carolinas and uh, Tennessee right now, that's one of the frequencies that's being used widely. So think of it this way. The ionosphere is like a frequency dependent mirror. It's not really a mirror, it refracts, but it can be thought of as something that reflects. And it's frequency dependent. Like if you have a piece of glass that'll let blue light through, but not green or red, okay, you've got a filter and you can put as much blue light through it as you want. Try green and red, won't go. The ionosphere is the same way. It allows different frequencies to be refracted back to the Earth in different ways at different times of the day and depending on certain solar parameters. The behavior of the ionosphere is heavily dependent on the behavior of the sun, particularly sunspots. Sunspots look dark. They are not dark. They are very bright, but they're not as bright as the rest of the sun, so they look very dark. It's those that spew out all kinds of junk, 
All the junk coming off the sun is collectively called the solar wind. And it comes out and hits our magnetosphere. The Earth is a big magnet and it's rotating. And as it does, it creates a rotating magnetic field that takes all of these particles from the sun, deflects them in different ways, okay? And uh, where it cannot deflect them is at the poles, where the magnetic lines of force come back in to the Earth. And so all that junk hitting our upper atmosphere creates what we call aurora. And that's where the aurora comes from. It's the Earth receiving the results of an angry sun. So, there you go. You understand now that different frequencies behave differently in the ionosphere. There's no handy relationship between them or anything like that. Generally in the daytime, if you find the lower bands dead, you keep going higher in frequency. This is vocap.com and it's run by some people who keep this all current with the right parameters and so on in the software and it's pretty reliable. You can use it. Now, it will only give you percentages. It will say something like you have a 75% chance of making a contact along this path. But it won't tell you, hey, it's going to come up in 15 minutes. It's not that accurate. We can't predict what the upper atmosphere does that. And notice that I keep saying upper atmosphere. There's something that extends up to about 300 miles. Doesn't the atmosphere end about 50 miles? Well, the sensible atmosphere ends, sort of, at that point. We call that the von Karman line. 100 kilometers. 100 kilometers is the von Karman line. Everything above it is officially termed space. Everything below it is officially termed atmosphere. Okay. But the actual amount of air up there goes down, 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 until it fades to the point where it's not sensible, meaning not measurable. Now, if you take something like the space station, which is in the very top of this incredibly thin atmosphere, there is some drag. So every so often you have to do a little propellant burn to nudge the thing back up to where it's supposed to be. And that's true of all LEO satellites like Starlink and all that sort of thing. They want to get 300 miles away from the Earth so that they're not burning a lot of propellant. If you take a, oh, spy satellites are rumored to fly down around 100 miles and they have to take a lot of propellant to stay up because that little tiny bit of atmosphere that's up there drags on them enough that it'll pull them down out of orbit. The space station is up in that range. By the way, keeping a satellite where it's supposed to be is called station keeping. So all of these lower Earth satellites have to do station keeping. There are very strange effects on all satellites. Now, the orbit that the science fiction writer Clark, Arthur C. Clarke, invented, he says there is a place in orbit where if you put a satellite, it will appear to be stationary as it orbits the Earth because the Earth rotates at the same rate. Often called a Clark orbit, more often called a geostationary orbit. Even so, the Earth wobbles. And as it wobbles, it causes the satellite orbits to wobble and they turn into great big giant figure eights. So there has to be station keeping even out there to keep them where we want them to be. What we do with old satellites that are dead is we move them even out further to where they'll start to counter-rotate and they'll get into some crazy figure eights but they're far enough away that they don't affect anything. That's probably more about the upper atmosphere than you wanted to know. But I just wanted to let you know that at the lower frequencies, you're going to want more power. By the time you get up to 10 meters, a peanut whistle will do the job. Why? Because there's so little atmospheric noise at those points. Most atmospheric static comes from thunderstorms. And the frequency range of the thunderstorms doesn't get up much above 10 to 20 megahertz, okay? So if you're up 28 megahertz, that region like that, you get some very quiet channels and hear some very far away stations operating very low power. So I hope that sends you on the right direction. This book right here, uh, Here to There, Radio Wave Propagation, it's from the ARRL. You can get it on ARRL or Amazon. 
The author is Ward Silver, N0AX. So it's by Ward Silver with contributions from others. There you have it. Get on the air. Get that DX. Jump all the irons hot. Because right now we're at the peak of the solar cycle. Until we next meet, 73.